Good morning, Gospel Lifers, and the entire Facebook family. Welcome. It's a beautiful day, and we thank God for another opportunity to come to you online with the Word of God. We have been looking at a series of eternal perspectives, and today we are uh, we're going deeper into it, understanding the book of Ruth. Uh, we hope and pray that this series has been helpful to you. It has been helpful to us as, as, a, as a family and as an entire nation to have a bigger picture of, of our relationship with God and our relationship with one another. So, Ka uh, Ange, as we wait to hear the sermon again. Karibuni. Praise the Lord. My name is Lawrence Kagira. Once again, welcome to Gospel Life. Stella has wel warmly welcomed us. Um, as she has said, we've been going through the series on eternal perspectives. And we started all the way from the book of Revelation. We looked at the book of um, Corinthians. And now we are looking at one particular family in the Old Testament, the book of Ruth, which is helping us to understand deeper at a very practical and personal level what it means to have an eternal perspective, to see how God works in and through the events and challenges that we are going through in order to bring out the best in us and in order to glorify himself in our lives. Um, last Sunday, we started the book of Ruth. We looked at chapter one. And in chapter one, we saw a family that was hit by disaster. There was famine in the land. They were hit by desperation. And they had to make some tough decisions based on the challenges that they were going through. And we looked at some of the decisions that they made, having to move from Israel to Moab. And looking at that decision and realizing that in desperate times, sometimes you make choices that may not be the best, that may not be in line with the law of God. Um, the sons of Naomi ended up marrying Moabite wives, which also was contrary to the law of God. And so disaster, desperation, and these things really resonate with us. We also go to see what it means when a family is hit by despondent, um, you know, times, despondence, a sense of um, sadness and, des and um, depression. Um, the family, they lost, Naomi lost her husband. She lost her two sons. Um, Ruth and Orpah were childless. And even when um, the famine ended in Bethlehem, when they had to go back, it was also another tough decision that they were facing. And finally, we got to see what it means to be in a destitute position, what it means to be brought low. And we saw that in the words of Naomi. When um, the chapter is closing, she says, I went away, you know, full, and now I've come back empty. But we also got to see that in all these situations, um, it's also interesting the kind of view that God, that Naomi had about God. She saw God as sovereign through all that was happening, which I took a bit of time to explain that in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, the saints were really cognizant of the fact that God was always involved in the things that they were doing. And so even when a bad things happened, they did not abstract or remove God from those tough situations. They still saw God in and through those tough situations that they were going through. And that was very encouraging for us. So when Naomi says, I feel that the Lord has dealt bitterly with me, that the Lord has afflicted me, she was still able to see that God was sovereign. And we also saw that there was the, the, the acts of God, which are directed by his providence. In fact, we defined providence, which was a definition that was a mouthful. But it talks about God. He upholds, he directs, he controls all things, all actions, all events. And he is bringing them according to his infallible foreknowledge, his power, his wisdom to glorify himself. And in chapter 2 and chapter 3, which is what I want us to focus on today, this Sunday, what we will see is again the hand of providence. And again we'll see how the gospel is declared to us in the book of Ruth. And so I'd encourage you to get your Bibles. Um, these are two chapters. They are long chapters. So what I'll do is I'll make my points and then we'll be looking at different verses. I'll try and give a summary or an overview of the two chapters. And then we'll get into the text itself. And we'll, what I want to do this Sunday is I, I want us to look at these three characters that we will meet. The focus will primarily be on Ruth, who is um, the main character in the story. 
but also at Boaz, who is introduced to us now in this chapter. And then we look at Naomi a bit. Um, the two chapters do not really focus a lot on her, but we'll concentrate more on Ruth and Boaz. And then finally, and more importantly, the key character in the Bible is God himself. And what we'll be looking at is how does God act in and through providence? How does God's sovereignty in eternity and the decrees he has made for us, how do they come to play in time? And how does that help to shape our worldview? Again, how does it help us to shape, to have an eternal perspective, to shape how we view things, to shape how we live, and the kind of characters that we're supposed to be espousing to have? So that's what we'll be doing today. We'll look at Ruth, we'll look at Boaz, a bit on Naomi, and finally on God, who is our main character. So in these two chapters, in chapter two and in chapter three, what happens is Ruth and Naomi are now back in the land. They're back in Bethlehem. God has visited the land. The famine is over. There is supply of food. And while they are there, Ruth decides, remember, they are still destitute. That's where we stopped last, last time in chapter one as it ended. They're still destitute and in need. So Ruth decides to go out into the field and to glean from um, the fields where people had planted. In Israel, God had made a law in Leviticus and Deuteronomy that as people, you know, reaped the harvest, they would leave some of the, the, the crops um, without picking all of them so that the poor could come and, and pick those up. So a farmer was not supposed to harvest everything. They were supposed to be considerate because they were poor people. That was a law that was a safety net for the poor in Israel. And so Ruth takes advantage of that. So she goes, and as we shall see, she really trusted in providence, and she finds herself in um, a field which belonged to Boaz. So when Boaz sees her and asks one of his servants, who is that lady? And the servant says, that's Ruth. She is the daughter-in-law of Naomi. She came to glean from the fields. She has been working all day. And Boaz is interested. And Boaz is so kind because he allows Ruth to, you know, glean um, the harvest. But he also makes provision to protect her. You know, tells her to glean, to glean among the, the female servants. He also provides water for her and food for her. He even shares food with her. And Naomi gleans, goes home, meets Naomi, um, her mother-in-law, explains all the events that have taken place. And that's when Naomi remembers, oh, Boaz, he's actually one of our kingsmen redeemers, which is something that we shall look at. And um, now in chapter 3, what happens is Naomi, because Boaz is a kingsman redeemer, he can redeem back the property that they had probably lost before they left. And so she devises a plan where she tells Ruth to go and lie at the feet of Boaz to present her case before Boaz, her destitute case. And Boaz is very touched by the acts of Ruth. He's very impressed that Ruth left everything to come and follow her mother-in-law. And so Boaz decides that he will redeem both the property and he will fulfill his obligation according to the law of God to marry Ruth, provide an heir for her, and save the family. And so that's a, a, a summary of the two chapters. That is what is taking place. And so what I want us to do now is to get into the the text and think about all these three characters and see how the divine hand of providence um, shapes how the events unfold and how these characters, um, you know, flow with the providence of God. All of us go through difficult times, especially now through the pandemic. And we've really been thinking about how do we have this eternal perspective. I think these three characters will show us that. So I'll be reading some verses and making comments. But there are some character traits and points that I want us to see in, this, in these um, you know, characters that we see. The first one is Ruth. And uh, with Ruth, I'd like us to note three things about Ruth. First is her humility, secondly, her hard work, and number three, her honor, the honor she showed to Naomi. Humility, hard work, and honor. And um, we see this right off the bat when we begin chapter 2, verse 1, her humility. 
So it, chapter 2 verse 1 begins with, Now Naomi had a relative, her husband, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go into the field to glean amongst the ears of the grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And right from there, what I thought about was the humility that Ruth displayed. Notice, even as a destitute woman, as a woman who had left everything, her family, her kindred, her home, what she was familiar with in the land of Moab, and came, and she came all the way to Bethlehem with this woman who was old, who could not have provided her anything, even with that decision that she had made. Notice her humility. In her destitute state, she agrees to, number one, use whatever means there are to provide for both herself and her mother-in-law. Now, the reason I see this as humility is because, number one, she did not, her attitude was not, you know, I have grown up in plenty or I don't want to work in a certain kind of way because gleaning was almost essentially next to borrowing. It was almost a begging. It was going into the field and accepting your status as a poor person. And you see, even at this season, at this time, when people are being laid off work, people no longer have the normal means of income that they had before. People are losing their livelihoods. Ruth did not say, oh, well, you know, you know, you know, the prosperity kind of thinking, you know, God has to do this for me. God has to provide in this way, in this manner, in the way that I want. No, actually, Ruth was humble enough to say, whatever means I find, I will work. I will do that. And so if you notice that verse too, she says, I will glean in whoever's field I find favor. Notice in that destitute place, from a place of humility, she does not demand anything from God. And it is sad with our generation and the kind of upbringing with prosperity teaching and all, how many of us have been brought to think that we can even demand from God. That we do not see God as a God who is holy and yet gracious with us. You see, Paul says in Romans that if grace... Grace has to be grace. And if we can place a demand on grace, then grace isn't grace. If I can actually place a demand on God and demand that he do something for me, then those are things that should be counted as wages. Yet with God, we come with such a level of humility, such a level of, of being downcast, that we sit at his feet and we do not make demands. That even in our poor and destitute place, we have a lot of humility when we approach God in our prayers. We are able to humble ourselves and say that whatever means that providence will give to me, those are the means I will humbly accept. And so Ruth goes out without making any demand, but relying solely on the providence of God, whoever I will find favor with. That's her attitude. That's her heart. And that should teach us something, even as we are struggling now, that whatever hand or means that God sovereignly provides for us, we should be humble enough to accept those means and work in and through them because we know God is also at work in and through these means. We don't make demands as a people who believe in the grace of God. Then also notice her hard work. Also from the same chapters, notice how industrious she is. She does not say, you know, you know, you and me, we have to go. Talking to Naomi, we have to go and work. She's, she's very hardworking to the point that she looks at her mother-in-law and says, you remain in the house. Let me go and work. In fact, she says, I will go and glean. If you look at, um, at, at the, the kind of commendation that the servant says, when Boaz asks the servant, who is this woman? Listen to the, the response in which the servant gives about Ruth. She says, she is a young, this is verse 6, she is a young Moabite woman who came with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. And she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Ruth was an industrious woman. She was a hard-working woman. 
You know, in Timothy writes to the Thessalonians and says, he who doesn't work should not eat. Ruth did not reside to her destitute state and say, oh, you know, I won't do anything. This I'm I'm too I'm too low. I don't want to do this. No, actually, she does the exact opposite. She is she takes on her own initiative. In fact, in verse two, Naomi does not tell her to go and glean. It is Ruth who decides upon her own initiative to go and work. And she works hard from morning, only taking a short rest. In fact, in, in verse 17, still in chapter 2, it says, she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. It was a large amount. She worked the whole day. In verse 18, it says, she took it up and went into the city. And when her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, she also brought out and gave her mother-in-law food that she had been given by Boaz. This was a hard-working woman. In her difficult and hard circumstances, she still took initiative by herself. And this again tells us something. You know, we talked about sovereignty and providence. And it is sad that many Christians try and use the doctrine of sovereignty, you know, to promote laziness, to promote fatalism or determinism. You know, they, they take the doctrine of God being sovereign as an excuse not to work. You know, making statements such as, you know, the graph is already drawn. God will find a way of working out. Actually, providence and sovereignty is the, is the greatest comfort because we know we can work hard because that is the means through which God has chosen to bring his purposes to come to pass. And so Ruth was humble in her poor state. She was a hardworking woman, even in her poor state. And number three, she was an honorable woman. She honored her parents. She is the perfect example of, you know, God's commandment that says, honor your father and mother. Which is the first commandment with a promise that you may live long in the land. Ruth honored her mother-in-law. Notice how she works. How she seeks to take care of her mother-in-law how she left everything in chapter 1 to come and follow this woman and how when she is in this destitute and poor place she is a foreigner in the land of Bethlehem yet she honors her mother-in-law and says you stay at home let me go and work that is in verse 2 but also in verse 19 and 23 we see that Ruth allows Naomi to examine what she did in fact when she comes back home Naomi in verse in verse 20 in verse 19, asks her, you know, where did you glean? And how, where have you been working? You see, parents have a right to examine us as children. Our guardians have a right to question what we've been doing. Ruth, Ruth does not take the attitude of, I don't need to be asked, or I am an adult, you know. She actually takes the, the, the time to be examined, to have her work looked at by her mother-in-law, which number one shows us honor. In fact, in verse 23, um, Naomi says, Naomi advises her, her daughter, and she says, continue to glean in the field with the young women. And Ruth takes that instruction seriously because she honored her parents she honored her mother-in-law in chapter 3 when Naomi gives her instructions about how to request Boaz to be their kingsman redeemer Ruth follows her instructions to the detail to the letter she follows what her mother-in-law says and again that teaches us something about honoring our parents and caring for them in the book of Timothy, Paul writes and says that he who does not take care of his relatives, especially his immediate family, is worse than a blasphemer. It's such a powerful statement. And Ruth here is a picture. She epitomizes what it means to honor our parents. And so from Ruth, even in a destitute and poor state, she teaches us humility, hard work, and being honorable, and taking care of our parents and the elderly. Quickly, I'd like to move on to Boaz, who is the other character that we are introduced to in these two chapters. What do we see from Boaz? Remember, Boaz is to become a picture of Christ. 
He is to become the kingsman redeemer of this family. What do we see about Boaz? The first thing we are told right off the bat in chapter 2 verse 1 is that Boaz was a worthy man from the clan of Elimelech. A worthy man. And in certain versions it says a mighty man. In, in, in other, um, you know, when you check the language, some will say he was mighty in wealth, he was mighty in the law of God. You know, he is a reputable man. He was known to have a good character and he was also wealthy. He, was, he had servants, he had fields, but he was also wealthy in terms of his piety in terms of what he believed about God. And that we see all through the chapter. His character in terms of how he believed in the law of God. He believed in, in following through and taking care of his employees and his family. And so that's why verse, chapter 2 verse 1 begins was he was a worthy man. What we learn from Boaz, again, I'd like to just cite three things. Number one, he cared for his servants. He cared for his employees. Number two, he was considerate. He had a considerate attitude towards those who are in need. And number four, number three, we see he was a compassionate man. Now, the three of them kind of relate. His caring heart, his compassionate heart, and his considerate attitude. Number one, let's, let's look at his, the care he had for his servants. Look at verse four in chapter two. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and he said to the reapers, to his servants, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. What a wonderful way to introduce this character, this man called Boaz. Notice how much he cared for his servants. He begins by a commendation, by blessing them. This tells us something about you if you are an, employ an employer right now. For instance, in this season when when we are having to lay off workers or to put your own workers on half salary. What kind of attitude do you have about the people who work for you? Do you care about them? Do you commend them? Do you pray for them? That's what we see with Boaz. The Lord bless you. And we know Boaz was a caring man because even the servants loved him. Because even the servants respond by saying, the Lord bless you too. Still in, in verse 4. They cared about him, and he cared about them. Um, I point that out because, you know, many of us who are employed or who you're working under someone, you know, there is always a very tense relationship between an employee and an employer, between you and your supervisor. And some are very harsh, nasty, and evil. Um, I remember my aunt telling me a story of one who, you know, an employee is given a lift by the employer, and then she leaves her phone by accident in the car. And the employer tries to call the employee. But then as the phone is ringing, um, the name that appears as calling is Shetani calling. Eh? The devil is calling. Um, and that makes you really think, eh? because this is an employee who has saved you know, the employer or the supervisor as the devil. That's sometimes the kinds of relationships that we have. And so this poses a challenge for us as employees. Do we pray for our employer? But even us as employers, those of us who are employers, what's your relationship? Are you, do you have a caring heart like Boaz? And this caring heart is not just in the commendation and in the prayer. Look at verse 5, which really struck me. Because in verse 5 of chapter 2, Boaz recognized that there was a stranger in the field. Which means Boaz had an intimate relationship with the people that worked under him. The, the relationship was intimate to the point that he could notice there was a stranger. So he looks at Ruth and asks in verse 5, says to this, to this young man, who is that young woman? He noticed the employees were not just a crowd to him. He could notice that there was a face in the crowd that was different. Who is this? That's a caring man. He could see all the, the, the employees. So Boaz teaches us to be compassionate to those who work under us, to those who are below us, not to have an attitude of pride or wanting to stamp, not to make those who are under us to work as though they are walking on eggshells around us, but to feel care and, and you know, a blessing being there around us. The second thing we see with Boaz is, Boaz is a considerate man. He had a considerate attitude. 
Look at verse 8. Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter. Addresses her with a lot of, um, you know, care. My daughter, though she was a foreigner. And he says in verse 8, do not glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to the young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink that the young men have drawn. Notice how considerate he is. He knew that Ruth, as a woman in these times, would have faced different kinds of challenges. And not just as a woman, but even as a foreigner. She could have mis been mistreated. She could have been abused and misused. Yet Boaz is so considerate that first of all, he charges her to remain with the other women who are working for him. But he also provides water for her. And he even charges the young men not to disturb her or, you know, deal with her harshly. That's a considerate attitude. In verse um, 14, Boaz invites Ruth to come and eat and dine with him and the rest of the servants. He says, come here and eat some bread and dip your muzzle in the wine, in the vinegar. Make your food tasty. You know, he did not just consign her out there. He was so considerate that he actually wants her to enjoy what the others are enjoying and what he himself is enjoying. Again, what a considerate attitude that we learn from this man. You know, if we look at the, the words of Naomi, what Naomi says about Boaz in verse 23. He says, you know, blessed be Boaz, who has, who, whose kind, who by his kindness has not forsaken the living and the dead. So Boaz is here known as a man who is considerate. And finally, his compassion um, in, in verse 20, which is the verse I have read, may, may he be blessed whose kindness, the kindness of Boaz, is shown to the living and the dead. You know, that's a commendation. And also in chapter 3, as we shall see, chapter 3 in verse 10, again, the compassion of Boaz. He says, and he said, Boaz, may you bless the Lord, my daughter, for you have made this lasting kindness greater than the first, and that you have not gone after the young men. I promise you that I will surely redeem you. And therefore, lie down and wait until morning. What a, what a blessed attitude. He was fully ready to redeem both Ruth and Naomi. And that's compassion. Though he could have decided to do otherwise, his heart was so compassionate that it went out for this woman. This woman who was a foreigner, who had left everything to follow, you know, the mother-in-law, and she and he, Boaz, could look at Ruth and see the love and care that she had displayed towards Naomi and be compassionate. And therefore with Boaz, we learn that we need to be caring for those who work under us or those who are beneath us. We learn that we need to have a considerate attitude towards those who are going through hard and difficult times and go above and beyond what is simply required of us. Boaz did not just tell Ruth, you know, just glean and, you know, that's it. He went above and beyond that. And that shows us that he was compassionate as well. Quickly and... Um, I would like to look at Naomi for a while before I talk about God, who is the main character in the whole, the whole Bible. Look at Naomi's attitude towards Ruth. Naomi loved Ruth. She loved this, this daughter-in-law. This, this woman who had left everything, even when Naomi had nothing to offer her. And we see that, for instance, in, um, in chapter 3, from verse 1 to 4. Now here we have, in chapter 3, 1 to 4, we have a set of verses which appears very controversial to us, living in our, living in our day and times. Because we see Naomi requesting um, Ruth to do an act which appears indecent to many of us. 
who are removed from these, um, you know, from the times in which we read. But I'd like you to 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 indulge me and to indulge, you know, to indulge the the, the scriptures because the scriptures are written yes from a culture that's very different and removed from ours. In fact, in chapter four, as we shall see next Sunday, when they are talking about redeeming property. Boaz and, and a certain man, they're exchanging sandals, and which appears very weird to us, eh? which is also what we see in chapter 3. In chapter 3, Naomi's heart towards, towards Ruth um, is seen. It, it begins by saying, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to Ruth, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is Boaz not our relative, um, with whose young women you are? Um, it continues and says in verse 3, Wash yourself and anoint yourself and put on the cloak and go down to the threshing floor and do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place and cover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what you are to do. And she replied, All that you do, all that you say, I will do. And so Ruth goes and lies down. Now this 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 passage, um, some see it as indecent. In fact, the 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 theologian uh, Ma Matthew Polo, uh, in his um, you know, in his notes about these passages, a great preacher thinks for him he feels that Naomi was actually being indecent. That probably Naomi should have found a better way of asking uh, Boaz to be their kingsman redeemer. But I tend to think of it differently, um, as many other commentators have tried to think through this. Number one, if you look at the, the way the author of this book portrays all these three characters, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, they are not portrayed as people who had any indecent acts or evil motives. In fact, with Boaz in the beginning of chapter 2, we are told he was a mighty man. As I've said, some versions will even say mighty in the law, mighty in the scriptures. When we look at Boaz and how he's portrayed, he was a God-fearing man. In fact, when Boaz was requested to redeem Ruth and Naomi, he was so cognizant of the fact that the law said that it had to be an immediate relative. And so he doesn't just rush to redeem this person. He actually wants to follow through with what the law says. Now that tells us that Boaz loved God, loved God's law. And therefore, again, it tells us that whatever Naomi is requesting Boaz, we, we should not think evil of it. Again, when we think about Naomi, we saw in chapter 1 that she had a very strong belief in the sovereignty of God. She saw God as involved even through her pain and through her affliction. We saw her as a woman who loved her daughters-in-law to the point that she was willing to let them go so that she did not have to drag them along. And so, Naomi, we cannot impugn evil motives on her with the act that she requests Ruth to do. Also, when we look at Ruth, we see her as a woman who had really been transformed. Remember, she is a young proselyte. She is a young convert to Judaism. And yet, she left everything. And you know, in chapter 1, she says, your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there also will I be buried. She left everything. She counted the cost of discipleship. And therefore, again, by the time we are getting to chapter 3, we again cannot impugn evil motives. I think for me, I see, I see these, these verses as an excellent picture for us of what it means to come to God, to lie at his feet, and to ask him to redeem us. Notice, Naomi does not tell Ruth to go and in any way seduce um, Boaz. He, you know, she does not tell him to go and lie at his side or anywhere. She says, notice where Boaz is and lie at his feet which again serves as such a beautiful picture of how we are to approach God. Remember what I said. Ruth shows us that for grace to be grace, we cannot place a demand on it. And it is sad that even when we think about how we approach God in our days and times, in what is commonly referred to as altar calls, it is simply things like, Actually, it's, it's us who are told to make the decision for Jesus. 
Like Jesus is the thing we are, we are the ones choosing him. Yet when we read the Bible, when people approached God, it was not with an attitude of choosing him. There was never an attitude of pride, as though Jesus was on the dock and I was the judge and I'm having to decide for him whether I want him or not. Actually, it was always the other way around. It was I, the sinner on the dock, and Jesus, the judge. And on the dock, what the only thing you could plead was the mercy of God. In fact, a story is told, I'm not sure whether it's a real or it's made up of Napoleon. And, you know, Napoleon found out that there was a man among his army who had been stealing and doing, you know, wrong things in the army. And he decides to convict the man to death. And the wife of this man is pleading for the life of her husband. And when Napoleon asks, you know, give me a reason why I should spare your husband. And the woman responds by saying, if I had a reason, I would not be pleading for mercy. That's such an excellent story to tell us how we are to approach God. If you have a reason for what you are asking God, then that's not grace. That is not justification by faith. If you have a reason why God should give you a job, then you're not asking for grace or mercy. Actually, you're operating based on our works of righteousness. If you have a reason why you think God should heal you, if you have a reason why you think God should be good to you, other than the reason being found in God himself. You see, that's the thing that when I look at the picture that's portrayed for us here, that I see, that you see grace has to originate fully from God. It has to be in and of itself an act of God. And therefore, if God is saving me, if I'm coming to him for salvation, mine is to plead his mercies, is to say, God, you love me, therefore save me. And quickly, I would say this. When we read that verse in John 3, 16, that says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God's love is so much different from our idea of love. You see, when, and this is pointed out by D.A. Carson, professor of New Testament studies in Trinity Divinity Evangelical School. He points out and says, you see, when we talk of love among humans, if a man tells a woman, I love you, what that means, at least what that means is the, the man finds something about this woman that's lovable. You know, I love you means there is something lovely about you that has attracted me to you, that makes me want to be with you. But think about John 3, 16, when God says, for God so loved the world. What about the world was lovable? What about you do you think is lovable? How do you approach God yourself? Do you think there was anything in and of you that commended you to God? That there were things that you did that were somehow meritorious? That they somehow could make God do something? No. When God says that he loved the world, it had nothing to do with the world being lovable. It has all to do with the fact that God himself was love. And therefore grace is lying at the feet of our Redeemer. And expecting nothing from him, but like Ruth, looking at Boaz and saying, redeem me. We cannot place a demand on God. And that's what makes grace, grace. And therefore those verses, no matter how weird they look to us, you know, in our culture and in our times, it's, an, it's a beautiful picture of what the gospel is like, of how we come to God, that we demand nothing of him whether health, provision, salvation, God gives because he himself is love. And when you think of that, salvation is all of God. It makes us fall at his feet and worship him. Because if you have anything, it's because God has loved you. And that brings me to what I would conclude with about God being the main character in this story. Remember with Ruth, we saw her humility, her hard work, and her honor. With Boaz, we saw his care for his servants. We saw his considerate attitude towards those who are poor and his compassion for those who are needy. With Naomi, we see her love for her daughter-in-law. With God, when we think about providence, 
Number one, what do we learn about providence in these two chapters? We see that providence, number one, is a secret work. It is a sustaining work. It is a supernatural work. It's a saving work and it's a self-glorifying work. In all these, it's a secret work. Notice how God is working behind the scenes. That's how providence work. You see, you see, in a simple, you know, trying to define these terms, sovereignty is God's act in eternity. Providence is how those sovereign acts come to, to fruition in time. How we see sovereignty coming to us. It's a secret work. God was working behind the scenes. Notice in verse 2 it says, talking about Ruth, let me go into a field and glean. In a field, in for whoever's, you know, in whoever's sight I will find favor. She placed herself in the hands of providence. And then what does it say as it continues? That she found herself in Boaz's field. In fact, I think in the NIV or one of the versions it says, as luck would have it, she found herself there. Calvin would say it, providence appears for us to be fortunate. It appears to be by chance. And yet we know God is at work. And so ours is not to keep trying to second guess God. It is to believe that God is at work in and through all the simple actions and decisions that we are making. Providence is the secret work of God. He is at work behind the scenes. And so we can trust in God's acts of providence. We also see that providence is a sustaining work. God sustained this family. He sustained Ruth and Naomi. First of all, he led them into a field where he knew that Ruth would be allowed to glean. He also sustained them in that he, he gave Ruth favor in the eyes of the owner of the field, such that she was, she was protected. She was told to glean among the female servants. The, the owner of the field, Boaz, um, had so much favor for her that he instructed the men not to um, harass or abuse her. So God's work of sustaining, she worked throughout the whole day and was able to provide for her mother-in-law, a family that had been poor and that Naomi had says they were empty. They had nothing. Yet Ruth, who left everything, counted the cost of discipleship and came to this land with nothing but the love that she had for God and for her mother-in-law. She was sustained all through. And God helped her to find a kinsman redeemer who would bring her not just from a place of being destitute to where they had been, but give her so much more. And so with the providence, we see it's God's secret work. It's God's sustaining work. So God will sustain you through all the challenges that we are going through. Finally, we see it's a supernatural work. Providence is a supernatural work. It is the act of God in a way in which we cannot understand. In that, in these two chapters, we see God as being sovereign, yet at the same time, we see human responsibility. Ruth did not say, I prayed and waited in the house for food to find her, you know, where she was. She still believed that God was sovereign and that she needed to take responsibility. And this makes us know that the sovereignty of God is not... It's not an ex excuse for us to reside back and have a fatalistic attitude about life. When we talk about having an eternal perspective, it should give us comfort to know that God is on the throne and at work. And that should give us the greatest impetus to go out there and be a hardworking people, to take, to take um, advantage of the means of grace that God has provided, no matter how low they appear, even if it is gleaning, that we are to work hard even in that poor and destitute place. Why? Because providence is a supernatural act of God to care for us and to provide for us. And finally, it's a saving work. It's a saving work because providence ultimately brings us to salvation. That's what we see with Boaz. That's what we see with Ruth. Boaz makes the, the, the decision that I will save you. I will redeem you. That's what providence was bringing this family to. Remember, Ruth is to become, to enter the lineage of Jesus. Jesus. 
And so these stories have to give us a wonderful picture of salvation. And so providence not only is about God leading us through, you know, sustaining us in our difficult times, bringing us through when we are afflicted, seeing us, you know, giving us strength when we are poor and in pain. It is also about our salvation because ultimately that's what God cares about. Paul says that God's plan and purpose is that he has predestined us in Romans 8, 29 to be conformed to the image of the Son, to be saved. And salvation is the greatest blessing that we can have. No matter how much pain or suffering we may go through in this world, salvation is the greatest blessing. And therefore, providence is a saving work. It's a supernatural work and a saving work. And lastly, I would say the providence of God is God's self-glorifying act. God is glorifying himself through all that he's doing. In these three chapters, God is working to bring all things to work, to pass in a way in which he will get the glory and we will get the satisfaction and the fulfillment of being in him. What we see in these chapters is God leading a family, two women who are downcast and destitute with nothing. And in chapter four, what we will see is they will be so blessed and they will be at a place where they will receive the blessings of God and they will be the progenitors of the lineage of Jesus. And therefore, when we think of providence, when we think about having this eternal perspective, we need to remember that like Ruth, we need to be humble, hardworking, and honoring our parents. Like Boaz, we need to care for those around us. We need to have a considerate attitude towards those who are struggling. And we need to be compassionate. And with God, we need to realize that his providence is a secret work. It's a sustaining work. It's a supernatural work. It's a saving work. And finally, it's a self-glorifying act. So I'd like... Let's think about those things as we have this eternal perspective. As we are going through life, let us think through these two chapters. And um, when we meet next Sunday, we will look at chapter 4, the conclusion to this wonderful story. And we will see how God's great hand of providence and sovereignty will bring this family and set them up on a pillar where we can learn a lot from them. Again, God bless you. Um, at this point, I'd like us to worship our God with our giving. Um, let us give to continue supporting the work of ministry. And um, also as an act of thanksgiving that shows that we are still trusting God for his provision. Remember to stay safe during this period. Let's continue working hard. Let's support one another. Um, those who are struggling, let's support them. God bless you. We love you very much. If you'd like to get in contact with Gospel Life, please go ahead and do so. We love you and may the Lord bless you. Thank you.